out of control. Bushfires destroy at least 59 homes in Perth. Flood chaos at both ends of the state after the big weekend wet. Vessels, great and small, untangling some of Yazi's handiwork. And a stalemate on the streets despite some concessions in Cairo. Good evening, Ian Henderson with ABC News. A fierce bushfire has destroyed at least 59 homes in Perth's southeastern suburbs tonight, last night and today. And as we go to air, it's still burning out of control. Dozens more homes may still be in its path and hundreds of people have had to evacuate. As Alicia O'Flaherty reports, it's an anxious wait. Hundreds of firefighters worked through the night trying to contain several bushfires across Perth. Of greatest concern, this blaze at Rollystone in the city's southeastern suburbs. At least 59 homes were destroyed and 28 damaged as strong winds fanned the flames. Residents in the path of the fire had little choice but to get out. It's just rang up and said, you know, it's uh, lock your doors and windows and it's got to go. You can see it at the top of each road, a huge big line of fire on the hill there. And so it's a very, very dangerous situation to stay. Many spent the night at evacuation centres, waiting to find out if their homes were still standing. Obviously we're hoping, fingers crossed, that it's still all OK. Others were prepared to defend their properties. We're pretty confident uh, we'll manage it as it walks its way up here. So. Firefighters continued to battle the blaze into the morning and it soon became clear how much had been lost. Authorities warned residents it wasn't safe to go back to their properties, but some managed to return. Bob Walton found his home destroyed. Yeah, the fire was coming up here pretty quickly and it was a question of do we go, will I have my wife with me? And I said, no darling, we're off, we're going. Little yeah, survived except a treasured trophy and a sense of humour. The ashes out of the ashes, huh? <laughs> Brendan Boston is one of the lucky ones. His home is still standing despite the blaze destroying properties around it. Everyone was devastated and we get to walk away with our house still standing, so... The WA government has declared the area a natural disaster zone and Victoria has offered firefighters and two helitacks. Authorities say they'll need the help, with firefighters facing another long night. Alicia O'Flaherty, ABC News, Perth. Well, Victoria has sent two firefighting teams and firebombing helicopters to Perth to help battle the bushfires. The Perth fires reached their height today on the second anniversary of the Black Saturday tragedy and they brought back distressing memories for those who survived that inferno. There were low-key Black Saturday memorial services in several communities today as residents paused to remember the 173 people who lost their lives. Francis Bell reports. Two years on from Black Saturday, there are glimmers of optimism from even the most incremental milestones. But as the physical signs of devastation continue to fade, the emotional trauma remains a daily struggle for many, including David Barton, who lost his home and business to the fires. Oh, I think uh, emotionally we're all still a bit of a mess, really. In some areas, including parts of Gippsland, property owners haven't even started rebuilding. There are people who've done it tough over, long, over the full two years who are still doing clean-up work. In the Kinglake area, which suffered the greatest loss of life, many people left homeless by the fires are still living in the town's temporary village. There's been about 35% uh, involved in rebuilding but there still leaves a lot to go. The area's former mayor, Lynn Gunter, is one of several bushfire survivors who have recently travelled to Queensland to volunteer in flood-stricken communities. She hopes governments there will learn from the experience in Victoria and cut back on what she sees as unnecessary bureaucracy. The biggest mistake, I think, is what doesn't need to be repeated, is setting up a recovery reconstruction authority that has no legislative power. For many bushfire affected communities, including here in Marysville, the economic recovery has been slow and patchy. There are plenty of new government buildings and community infrastructure, 
but regaining the tourist dollar and encouraging private investment is proving much more difficult. What we need here in town um, is full-time opportunities uh, that are permanent and that are well paid so that uh, people can uh, come here and bring their families. He says creating meaningful job opportunities is the only way to encourage people back to the town. Francis Bell, ABC News, Marysville. Well, back then it was fire, now it's flood. Farmers at opposite ends of the state are still coming to grips with the damage caused by the torrential rain over the weekend. Several farms southeast of Melbourne were virtually wiped out and vineyards around Mildura also suffered extensive damage. Some homes in Melbourne southeast are still cut off by floodwaters and may remain so for up to a fortnight. As if Victoria hadn't suffered enough, more flooding has left its ugly mark. In Mildura, 30 homes flooded in just one suburb. CFA, uh, SES, Lower Murray Water, been a big community effort. But nothing could be done to save some grape crops. Luckily, it wasn't a complete right. wipeout. The majority is going to be still pretty good fruit. The I Rimple School near Mildura is closed after stormwater drains were overwhelmed. We have actually had uh, here this morning a few students turn up, but um, the community members let them know that the school was closed and they said that the great smiles came over their faces and uh, away they went. Southeast of Melbourne, homes at Narry Warren and Pakenham are still underwater. The damage bill will be immense, and now the storms have also claimed a life. A 54-year-old Glen Waverley man has died in hospital after he fell three metres off his roof while repairing leaks. You need to make sure that you're not up in these ladders, particularly during the uh, height of the storm. Uh, the outcomes can be disastrous. At Coralin, an hour's drive out of Melbourne, 80% of Wayne Timonson's farm has gone under. This is what his potato crop looked like yesterday. He doesn't know yet if his family can afford to stay on the land. I guess until we talk to the bank manager as to whether we make that decision or not. But at the moment I'm in a very fighting mood and uh, I'm not going to give in. The clean-up will be hard work and heartbreaking. And no one here wants to talk about the weather forecast that more rain is on the way. Kerry Ritchie, ABC News, Coralyn. The town of Creswick in central Victoria copped it again on Friday night and was today cleaning up after its third flood in a matter of months. Local people are fed up and say it's time for some serious work on the town's drainage and flood defences. It's the third time Mark Patterson has had to deal with flooding in the past five months. And he's starting to think it has more to do with poor town planning than Mother Nature. They say a once in a lifetime flood, so I must be 300 years old now. Luckily, the water didn't quite reach his floorboards this time, but he's fed up with what he says is a lack of council action when it comes to drainage and infrastructure. If they want an impact study, come and talk to us residents who's had the impact for three third time. Locals say the town was probably saved from the latest floods after some debris was cleared from the creek on Friday. But they say more needs to be done. It's an old town with outdated systems. We've got places here where there are one or two houses, now there are 10 or 20 and the drainage system hasn't been upgraded to, to take that. And the creek's not the only problem in Creswick. This man-made lake has nothing to stop it from overflowing down the bank and across the highway straight into those homes. And on Friday, that's exactly what it did. Shirley Davies had to rip up her carpets after the lake flooded her home. It was gushing like a torrent. You had no hope of doing anything. She's so concerned it may happen again, she's decided to leave the sandbags at the door. Our waterways have gone into a sort of state of malaise uh, after a long period of drought. I think that was perhaps understandable. Uh, we hope that we can and are addressing some of those problems right now. The community says it simply cannot cope with any more floods. Kirsten Vaness, ABC News, Creswick. Parts of Pakenham were flooded too and residents who went under are blaming Victoria's desalination plant. They say contractors bulldozed a local levy to make way for a pipeline to the plant. Josie Taylor reports. Steve Cole says this flood damage to his Pakenham turf business never had to happen. Had that levy been in place, we would expect we would have kept the water in the, in the drain and not on the farms. Contractors building the desalination plant dug through nearby levee banks to make way for a pipeline. Residents warned the company one levee wasn't properly rebuilt 
and this is the result. I think, yeah, the Diesel have to, the Diesel pipeline um, joint venture needs to take some responsibility here. The state government admits Victoria's biggest water project was at least partly to blame. The spoil out of that drain was removed to put the pipeline through. There has been some localised flooding and an escape from that drain. Uh, six houses apparently have been flooded and it's an issue that is being investigated. The former Labor government started the Wonthaggy plant and is still defending it. Yes, we're going through terrible floods at the moment, um, but there will be another drought. The state government was elected on a promise to release the hidden contracts and detailed costs of the project, but won't say when that will happen. They are thousands of pages and we are working through those very meticulously. But if the $5.7 billion price tag increases, taxpayers won't have to pay it. The state does not have any exposure to cost blowouts on the site. That is something for AquaShore. Earlier, politicians came together for a church service marking the start of the parliamentary term. If there are any wise or learned men among you, let them show it by their good lives with humility and wisdom in their actions. Great expectations for a new parliament that sits for the first time this year tomorrow. Josie Taylor, ABC News, Melbourne. In far north Queensland, expert salvage teams joined the cyclone cleanup today to help untangle more than 80 boats which were jammed together at Port Hinchinbrook. A force of nature skittled them. Now a monster of the man-made variety is picking them up and sorting more than 80 boats. 15 tonnes of fibreglass and steel dangles in the air as men work from beneath with ropes to guide the boats to a safe resting place. Rob Porter's 50-ton steel yacht is also his home. Probably best not looking. Yeah, no, they'll get it in there, I'm, I'm, I'm confident. Some got lucky. Don Packman tied his catamaran to his neighbour's taller pylons before the storm surge swept in. Under the surface, the cyclones made an impact too. Reefs offshore from Tully and Cardwell bore the brunt of the cyclone, with coral broken but scientists say it will regrow. And tourism operators are hoping that message will tempt people back to the region. It can have an impact on tourism for about 12 to 18 months. So there is a big job to actually get out there and change the perception that a big area like Queensland is closed or flooded. But scientists warn it's not clear sailing yet. Look, I was pleasantly surprised. I was expecting some impact uh, out there. The clean-up in the small communities between Townsville and Cairns continues. A thousand workers are now on the ground trying to restore power and self-contained villages have been built to house them. We need to make sure that while we are assisting the community that we're not also posing a drain on that community. And the community is doing all it can as business slowly gets back to normal. 63 schools are still closed, 137 are badly damaged. Getting them back into their normal routine is one of the biggest ways we can contribute to families getting their life back into some normality. And already the competition started to find the best show and tell story of the week. Lynn Keep, ABC News. The Prime Minister has appointed new watchdogs to keep an eye on the repair bills during Australia's big flood and cyclone reconstruction program. Tony Abbott says it's an admission the government can't control money. As Mark Simpkin reports, Parliament starts considering the government's flood levy legislation this week. Back to Canberra, back to business. We uh, need to get underway. So... Cabinet members were buoyed by part of the latest news poll. It suggests 55% of people support the flood levy, 41% back the opposition's opposition. I think the real question is, do people trust this government not to waste taxpayers' money? Uh, that's the real question and I noticed that that wasn't put. It's a question the government's keen to answer. Commonwealth reconstruction money will have strings attached and a special oversight body will be set up. Former Howard Government Minister John Fay will have the power to inspect rebuilding projects, check accounts and investigate complaints. As Prime Minister, I want to make sure that every dollar we spend on rebuilding from the floods and the cyclone is a dollar that gets value for money. Julia Gillard's trying to insulate herself from the criticisms of pink bats, green loans and school halls. I do acknowledge that I've learned some things. 
addressing his own troops. OK, gentlemen, ladies, team, bit of shush. Tony Abbott argued the government's learnt nothing. Today, they have effectively accepted that they can't be trusted by mon with money. Shadow Cabinet discussed alternatives to the flood levy, debating $1.8 billion in budget savings. Some of the cuts being considered include foreign aid to Africa, assistance to the car industry, Murray-Darling water buybacks and school halls projects. Labor's looking for its own budget savings to fund the cyclone cleanup. Welfare cuts are being considered and that's causing division in caucus. The baby bonus and the uh, uh, family payments to third and subsequent children, uh, these are areas of uh, middle class largesse that were introduced by the Howard government basically as vote buying measures. I note that the uh, budget guessing game has started a little bit early. A game with 12 weeks left to play. Mark Simpkin, ABC News, Canberra. A key prosecution witness has told Judy Moran's murder trial she drove him and the alleged gunman to and from the scene of the crime and offered to dispose of their clothing. Moran is accused of killing her brother-in-law, Desmond Tuppence Moran, in Ascot Vale a year and a half ago. Today, Michael Ferrugia told the court he'd received threats and was risking the lives of himself and his family by testifying. Key witness Michael Farooja's face can't be shown and the trial was moved to the more secure county court for his evidence. Asked by prosecutor Mark Rochford SC what happened that day in June 2009, Farooja told the court Judy Moran drove him and the alleged gunman Geoffrey Amore to an Ascot Vale deli where Des Moran was shot. He said she kept the car running in a car park around the corner and when he and Amore returned, she asked Amore, did you get him? To which Amore replied, yeah, no worries. I got him. Ferrugia testified Moran then said well done and patted him on the back. He described the gangland widow as being in control and said she told him and Amor to remove their clothes which she promised to get rid of. Moran's lawyer Bill Stewart put it to Ferrugia that he'd made up her involvement saying I suggest to you Judy Moran was neither seen by you that day nor did what you say. To which Ferrugia replied, I'm telling you, what's in my statement is true and correct. Adding, why should I lie about it? Put my family in danger. You think I'm that stupid. Michael Ferrugia denied any knowledge of a murder plot, telling the court he thought he was going to help Armour with a debt collection. He gave evidence he'd never met Des Moran and didn't know him. Ferrugia pleaded guilty to manslaughter and agreed to give evidence against Judy Moran. He admitted he was given a reduced sentence for testifying, but denied doing a deal to implicate her. The trial continues. James Bennett, ABC News, Melbourne. Defence is tonight flying home the body of the Australian soldier killed in Afghanistan last week. Fellow soldiers paid their last respects to 22-year-old Corporal Richard Atkinson in a ramp ceremony at Tarrant Cout. Corporal Atkinson was killed by an improvised bomb last week. He was Australia's 22nd casualty of the Afghan campaign. Defence has also released the findings of its investigation into the 21st casualty, SAS Trooper Jason Brown, who was shot dead last August. Unfortunately, Trooper Brown sustained fatal wounds around his body armour. The inquiry officer is satisfied that Trooper Brown's dress and equipment were suitable to the task he was undertaking, providing a good balance of protection and mobility. The inquiry found Trooper Brown was shot at close range by a concealed enemy fighter. Egypt's opposition groups, including the banned Muslim Brotherhood, say government proposals to end the political crisis don't go far enough. Talks have produced more concessions from the government but have failed to break the impasse with protesters. From Cairo, the ABC's Ben Knight reports. Cairo might be looking more like its old self, but near Tahrir Square there are still long lines of people wanting to join this protest. In the city, the banks are open and Cairo's had its first traffic jam in over a week. <laughs> But while Egyptians might be happy to see law and order back on the streets, that doesn't mean they have to like the officers. Egyptians will tell you that their traffic police are corrupt and that the riot police are thugs. But the most feared and detested of all are the secret police. And in the past two weeks, they haven't gone anywhere. 
Human Rights Watch says thousands of Egyptians have been detained by the state since these protests began. It's very brutal. Um, people are tortured. Um, they receive electric shocks. Um, they're often sodomized um, by their interrogators. Um, they're beaten very brutally. The organisation says this man, Egypt's new vice president, Omar Sleiman, has himself been involved in torture in his years as head of military intelligence. Yesterday, Omar Sleiman sat down for talks with the Muslim Brotherhood, an opposition group whose members have frequently been imprisoned by his regime. The government is offering some opposition figures a place on a panel to try and find a way forward to free elections. The government's also promised that the foreign media in Egypt are free to work, but yesterday there were more arrests, including the crew from the ABC's foreign correspondent program. Democracy, it's not. But even so, more and more Egyptians seem prepared to trust this government to keep its promise to change. Ben Knight, ABC News, Cairo. To finance now, and the local share market closed flat today. But retail stocks took a hit after December sales figures disappointed and Maya cut its profit forecast. Here's Alan Kohler. Well, the stories you're hearing from shopkeepers that they're doing it a bit tough are true. The Bureau of Statistics has confirmed that retail sales are quite a bit weaker than expected for both the December month and quarter. But the big problem today was that Maya shocked the market by reporting a fall of 3.5% in sales for the latest six months and said that profit would be down about 5% for the full year. As recently as November, the company had predicted profit growth of 5 to 10% this year. An announcement today that Meyer had bought 65% of Sass and Bide for $42 million did not help, and its shares fell 12%. And the backwash hit its rivals, David Jones and Harvey Norman. JB Hi-Fi was spared because it reported a 15% rise in interim profit and said the full-year result would be 13 to 17% higher than last year. The market as a whole rose just a few points, and two companies that appointed new chief executives today were among the biggest risers. Asciano is saying goodbye to Mark Rosethorne and hello to John Mullen. Fairfax has appointed Greg Highwood CEO after a few months of acting in the job. Elsewhere, the banks went up, but the big miners slipped a bit. On Friday, US jobs data for January came out. Employment was a lot lower than expected, but the unemployment rate fell from 9.4 to 9% anyway. But what's interesting is that the jobs growth is mainly in manufacturing, which obviously suffered badly in the recession, but has now had its biggest month for many years. While there are still plenty of layoffs in finance, which actually caused the recession. The Aussie dollar is down slightly today, but there's not a lot in it, and that's finance. In AFL news, the Western Bulldogs have carpeted several players who were caught harassing local people while on holiday in Hong Kong. This video was posted on the internet. It shows Brownlow medalist Adam Cooney and teammate Jared Grant stopping traffic in a nightclub precinct. At one point, Cooney jumps on a tray and slides down the street while Grant jumps on a car bonnet. The Bulldogs have described their behaviour as disappointing and totally unacceptable. The club wouldn't comment on whether it proposed to punish them. Australia's cricket coach Tim Nielsen has bluntly told his World Cup squad anyone with injury worries won't be going. Last night, Australia had the satisfaction of thrashing England in the final game of the One Day series. John Hayes Bell reports. After the Ashes struggle, the second half of the summer brought the locals some satisfaction. The Australians could briefly celebrate having their hands on the silverware. We've had contributions at different times from pretty well everyone in the squad. Um, so everyone's got a feeling they, their game's in decent order. But an injury cloud hangs over some in the 15-man World Cup squad. They won't be carried into the event. Ultimately, that puts a lot of pressure on the on the rest of the team. Even after a 6-1 series win over England, the coach wants a lift in performance from everyone who boards Wednesday's flight. Challenge is to try and keep improving, keep improving all the way through until you get to the to the big games. He's just 18 years old and banned from the game for five years for spot fixing. But Pakistani teenager Mohammad Amir hopes to win an appeal and make a successful comeback. Option to have my... I will never lose hope and I'll uh, do everything in my power to make a comeback, a strong comeback. The International Cricket Council has defended the punishments handed out to Amir and two teammates. For me, an excellent outcome that we've moved as quickly as we have. 
in demonstrating the kind of attitude we will adopt. Amir, Mohammed Asif and former Captain Salman Butt were suspended for a minimum of five years for their involvement in the deliberate bowling of no balls in last year's Lord's Test against England. They were the first team to win the Super Bowl and 45 years later the Green Bay Packers are on top again. The Packers raced to an early 18-point lead over the Pittsburgh Steelers. Touchdown! A flashy half-time display from the Black Eyed Peas gonna be a good night. promised an exciting second half and the Steelers delivered early, closing the gap to four. But Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers responded to lead his team to a 31-25 victory. Polish Formula One driver Robert Kubica's career is in jeopardy after he suffered multiple fractures in a high-speed rally crash. The 26-year-old Renault driver was behind the wheel when his car hit a church wall. He's undergone surgery, but there are serious concerns he may lose the use of his right hand. Fernando Torres cost $80 million and delivered very little in his first appearance for Chelsea. The former Liverpool striker had chances to impress against his old club. But after a disappointing display, Torres was benched midway through the second half. Which delights the Liverpool supporters. Liverpool's Raul Morelis scored the game's only goal to all but end Chelsea's hopes of defending the title. John Haysbell, ABC News. The AFL is mourning one of its trailblazers. Ground Operations Manager Jill Lindsay died this morning after a battle with cancer. She began her career as a VFL office clerk in 1970 and went on to become the longest serving employee in the AFL's history. So far, she's the only woman to be honoured with AFL Life membership. Chief Executive Andrew Demetria described Ms Lindsay as a mentor to many women in the football industry and a loyal and trusted friend. She was 61. And now with the weather, here's Paul Higgins. Thank you, Ian. Well, after the weekend deluge, we're in for more settled weather the next few days and a little cooler than normal for February. Today's state high was 25 degrees at a number of places in the west, and that came after a chilly morning. Have a look at that, just 2 degrees at Warrnambool first thing, and at Mount Hotham, minus 2. No rain today, but in the 24 hours to 9am, as much as 17 millimetres at Yurung Park, which is near Marlow in the east. Over the weekend, 240 millimetres at Red Cliffs in the Mallee. Uh, Melbourne South East took the brunt of Friday night storms, 180 millimetres at Lyndhurst, and today we had our coldest morning of the year with a low of just 10.8 degrees. It reached 21.5 at 2.19 this afternoon and is currently 19. Uh, much of outback South Australia is awash after 200 millimetres of weekend rain. There's a lot of road closures there. Kansas had uh, 26 millimetres today, but over in the west, hot and dry, and there's very little chance of rain around Perth in the near future. Now, the remnants of Cyclone Yasi are near the northwest corner of South Australia, some of that moisture is heading east and the rest will actually travel into Western Australia but not reach their southwest where those fires are. This passing cold front, that one there, will bring some early drizzle here. Fine on Wednesday underneath that high but Thursday into Friday a pressure trough across Victoria. It'll be humid but there's not enough moisture to tap into to bring us another day like last Friday. Tomorrow Perth, Adelaide and Canberra will be uh, dry and mostly fine in Hobart. In Sydney, Brisbane, Townsville and Cairns a shower or two. Coming back home now, a fine and sunny day tomorrow right across the north of the state and a little bit warmer than today, milder overnight too. Coastal drizzle tonight will spread inland during the early hours, then a fine afternoon with sunny breaks in the south and a southerly breeze. There's a major flood warning still for the Loddon River and moderate flooding on the Yarra River at Yarra Glen, moderate rural flooding at Swan Hill. Southerly winds on the bays t uh, 15 to 20 knots and seas getting up to one metre. No warnings for the bays but a strong wind warning for waters east of Wilson's Promontory. Well low clouds already rolling back into Melbourne. We'll have patches of drizzle or low cloud in the morning, but that should clear to a fine afternoon with some sunny breaks around too. Temperatures from 15 to 22 degrees in the city. Wednesday mostly sunny 26. Thursday though, it's going to get muggy. We'll have a few showers and maybe thunderstorms in the afternoon 29. On Friday 15 to 20 millimetres of rain by the end of the day 25. Saturday morning drizzle back to 21. Sunday 23 and Monday 26. But another autumn-like day tomorrow Ian. Thank you, Paul. Now, before we go, here again are tonight's main stories. Nearly 60 homes, possibly more, destroyed as bushfires sweep Perth's southeastern suburbs. And a tide of disruption after Victoria's flooding rains at the weekend. And who pays the repairman? Federal Parliament returns to debate disaster reconstruction. And that's it for this evening's bulletin. Next up, the 7.30 report from the newsroom. For the moment, good night.